In our second lesson, we uh, talked about the mandate for church discipline by looking at that text in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Now I'd like to look at a couple of case studies that we find in the Bible as to how this was exercised and how it was practiced in the early church. So I'd like to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and to uh, read this text for our consideration. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, so that you, uh, so the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean that the immoral people are of this world, or with the covetous and swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you'd have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are without, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. What an interesting text. If there were ever a city that was known to be wicked, it was the city of Corinth. Can you imagine wicked Corinthian pagans clucking their tongues as they hear the story of what's going on morality-wise within the church? Here was something that took place that even pagans thought was too pagan for them. A man was living with his father's wife. And the church had chosen not to obey the scriptures, not to discipline this man. And what we see is the consequence of that failure. Not only did they let this man persist in his sin, but they became proud in theirs. Their refusal to discipline was sin and they became proud of it. I can just see the banner outside the church. The church at Corinth, the loving church. And, and, and people are beginning to pride themselves for their acceptance of sin rather than dealing with it. So Paul writes and he says it is a distressing thing for him to hear of this and of their doing nothing about it and indeed becoming proud. Isn't it interesting that our vice becomes a virtue when we are disobedient to God and we persist in our sin? Somehow they think of it as their strength rather than their weakness. And rather than remove that person, they embraced him. What a tragic, tragic thing. Paul exercises discipline from a distance. He's not there, but he writes and he says, I've already exercised discipline myself. I've turned this person over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in order that his spirit might ultimately be saved. But he's saying to the Corinthian church, that's what you need to do. That's how you need to respond. They had taken the principle of separation and twisted it. They somehow had been separating themselves from the Corinthian world, from unbelievers, when they ought to have been penetrating that society but they had not separated themselves from sin within their own uh, ranks. And then what's interesting is, as we read between the lines between 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2, is that it looks as though the church at Corinth finally realized their sin. And so they exercised discipline on this individual 
and it appears that that individual came to repentance. And now we see Paul's follow-up on that discipline as we read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5-11. through 11. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him, for to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgive <coughs> anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what, have I, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What's fascinating to me is that the church at Corinth had failed to act, and so Paul acts first and challenges the church to do likewise. Now it would seem this man has repented, the church has become aware of it, and instead of receiving him back into fellowship, they've stiff-armed him and kept him separate, and he's overwhelmed with sorrow because he's kept out of the fellowship even though repented. So Paul says, once again, I'll take the lead. I have forgiven him, and you ought to do just the same in following my example. So it looks like this is the follow-up to what we have seen They've taken no action. Finally, they did. And once they took action, then once the discipline worked, they actually failed to restore the man to fellowship. It seems to me Paul is making it very clear that the purpose of discipline is repentance and restoration. And so just as the church at Corinth was in error in failing to discipline for sin, now it's in failure for refusing to restore one who has been disciplined and, and has come to repentance. Far too church, few churches today exercise discipline. It's a rare thing. And I might add, it's a rare thing for churches who are into the church growth movement because it doesn't look like the kind of thing that's going to draw people to you if you're sending people away for sin. Uh, but it's also something that I think those churches, let's say those few churches that exercise church discipline, I would say we're even weaker when it comes to restoring those who have fallen. That's a sad reality within the church that we somehow want to bury the fallen and not receive them back into fellowship. Now it's another question as to whether a leader who has fallen, <clears throat> excuse me, would be restored to leadership but it should never be a question as to whether one who has fallen would be restored to fellowship. Now, I want to, I want to bring a couple of verses to your attention that underscore the plurality of this discipline and restoration process. We saw that before in, in the instruction that was given in Matthew chapter 18. But listen to these two verses. Matthew, uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 14. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Now, if you look at the context of that, it seems to me it's very clear that he's talking to the brethren, not the leadership. He has just said to the brothers that they are to submit and honor and respect their leaders. But when he speaks to them here, I take it he's speaking to the church body, not just to the leaders. And the interesting thing is that he says that they are filled with knowledge so as to be able to admonish one another. I think if we are weak in discipline, we are weaker in admonition. Admonition is warning. It's saying to somebody, I see you headed down the wrong path. It's sort of like the book of Proverbs saying to a, a young lad, son, you can't see around that turn in the road, but I've been there and I know what it's like. You don't want to go that way. Admonition is seeing a trend or a tendency towards something that will lead to sin and it's heading sin off at the pass. Admonition is urging someone to deal with a problem before it becomes sin. And we're really weak on that. Sometimes we're forced to deal with sin when it finally crops up in the church. 
but we're not so strong when it comes to admonition and instruction for others who are heading in harm's way. Here's the second text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very, very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. It seems to me that one of the problems that we have in the church is that we often interpret people's lives and their problems in the light of our gift. So here I am, let's assume for the moment I have the gift of teaching. When somebody fails, my automatic inclination is to say, they've got an instruction problem. I gotta have a class for them. I gotta add this into the curriculum, whatever. And somebody with the gift of helps is inclined to see maybe there's some physical need that needs to be met. What's interesting about this is that you see that a problem may have different faces. Admonition is for those who are unruly. Encouragement is for the faint-hearted. Suppose that you try to encourage someone who's unruly or that you admonish somebody who is faint-hearted. Then you've produced the wrong effect. We need to help those who are weak. It seems to me this is one of those instances where you see the value of plurality of leadership. You see uh, the value of plurality of gift and function. That as the various gifts converge on somebody who's in difficult times, they see that it's a, it's a, it's a blending of needs. And that has a much more healthy approach. We're not all just unruly or faint-hearted or weak. Sometimes that may be the dominant characteristic but we need to deal with the total complexity of the problem and we do that through the plurality of gifts uh, and ministry that take place within the church. Here's three things I'd like you to think about. First of all, in the church, we are predisposed to not engage. We are predisposed to look the other way when it comes to discipline. We would rather not face it than deal with it. Think about David when, when Amnon uh, uh, rapes his daughter Tamar. David refuses to deal with it and he has a Absalom to deal with because of it. Jacob, when his daughter Dinah is assaulted, Jacob refuses to deal with it and so his sons slaughter a city. When we fail to deal with sin, we'll have bigger problems and our predisposition is not to engage. Secondly, our temptation is to withdraw. When there's a problem, withdraw. And we're not into restoration as much as we should. The third thing I would say is this, from a lot of experience. Even when we do the right thing, we often do it imperfectly. No, I'll change that. Even when we do the right thing, we always do it imperfectly. Never do we obey Scripture perfectly, but we still need to obey.